Good afternoon. Uh, and we get started here. I, a few more people will be uh, coming in, I think. I'm Bill Hoagland, a senior vice president at the Bipartisan Policy Center, and uh, I have the pleasure of working with the, uh, our evidence-based policy team and uh, on the report that they're issu we're issuing this afternoon. Uh, I'm a little surprised, quite frankly, to be honest with you, that uh, we even have this uh, kind of a turnout for something that tends to be a little wonky, a little bit uh, evidence-based, not uh, going forward. But, uh, uh, but it's, it is the mission of the Bipartisan Policy Center to bring together the best ideas from all quarters and for addressing the challenges that policymakers face. But it's also to do that with a very healthy dose of uh, rigorous analysis, which is the basis, the fundamentals of evidence-based decision-making. I uh, spent many uh, years up here, beginning at the Congressional Budget Office and almost a quarter of a century over here in the Senate side as a staffer, and I always believed that I gave the best evidence uh, to my bosses to make the decisions that they made, and I, but I also learned very quickly that sometimes my best efforts to have them follow the evidence didn't necessarily result in the vote that I thought they should have taken. Uh, that happened many times. So I, we all know there are many, many factors that are involved in the, in the, the decision making, including sometimes just gut feeling about an issue. Uh, nonetheless, having said that, uh, uh, evidence, having solid evidence, starting with evidence in the decision process is essential from my perspective in the deliberative process. And it's this, and it, this is the purpose of our whole discussion is to increase the quality and the effort of changing the culture of evidence-based policy making in the Congress going forward. Um, it was none other than James Madison, I understand, who argued that legislators should, and I quote, rest their arguments on facts instead of assertions and conjectures. So in this day and age of uh, sometimes uh, alternative facts, it is good to uh, reflect on Mr. Madison's admonishments to uh, all legislators, including presidents. Um, Speaker Ryan, uh, when he was chairman of the House Budget Committee and, uh, and as speaker, and has he continued since, he's continued to promote evidence uh, policy making and, uh, and along with Senator uh, Patty Murray. Uh, both were instrumental in the establishment of this uh, commission on evidence-based policy that was issued, uh, and they issued their report last September, I believe it was. Uh, Speaker Ryan has been a great champion of evidence-based policymaking, and, and we look forward to his continued leadership uh, on the topic moving forward during the remainder of his time in office, as we believe every member of Congress should be a uh, champion of evidence. So we're also excited to, uh, for some of you who know this, that, that uh, we were able to bring in to the Bipartisan Policy Center the Commission, carry on the Commission's work. Uh, last September with the leadership of our uh, Nick Hart, who was the Commission's policy director, along with Sandy Davis and Tim Shaw and Dan, Daniel Martins. Uh, uh, you'll hear from some of them later here this afternoon. So without further uh, uh, delay, let me turn this over to our newest board member of the uh, Bipartisan Policy Center, the Honorable Michael Steele, someone who knows firsthand the issues of balancing evidence and good policy decisions from his years of public service. So, uh, Michael, I don't think we have his bio. He doesn't really need an introduction, but former Lieutenant Governor of Maryland, former Chairman of the Republican National Committee, political an analyst with MSNBC, co-host of Steel and Unger's uh, show on Sirius Radio, and just all-around good guy. Uh, yeah. Mr. Chairman. Well, I haven't been called a good guy in a long time, so this is kind of nice. I like it. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate it. Well, welcome, everybody. I'm so glad you could uh, be here. Uh, and, Bill, thank you for uh, sort of laying the groundwork uh, for today's discussion. Certainly, as a new member of the board uh, for the BPC, it's a real pleasure and honor uh, to be able to uh, make this particular introduction uh, as we begin, I think, what is an important and necessary conversation. Uh, I've learned very quickly that bipartisanship uh, is not a dirty word, nor is evidence. Uh, and so I think if we start from that position, uh, we can begin to engage uh, proactively in a way that really transforms not just the political landscape, uh, but the policy-making opportunities that legislators have. 
Uh, and it goes to the core of what the BPC believes, uh, and it believes strongly that the clash of differing viewpoints um, when accompanied by rigorous, respectful debate supported with evidence-based research can better inform the policymakers uh, in making the kinds of uh, decisions they're making and the difficulty of those decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. But as the BPC staff also knows, and certainly as I've experienced firsthand in the various roles that I've played, that democratic debate is never a strict weighing of evidence. In the political world, emotion takes over. It has a certain appeal of its own. Um, certainly, uh, the cause and the country sometimes clash and collide, uh, but they are an important part of that de decision-making process as anything else. However, the swiftness of some of today to proudly defy evidence in that process is troubling, and it should be, because it undermines our capacity to reach a bipartisan consensus. In this environment, warring political tribes determine their own facts, or some might say their alternative facts. But the truth is, as you live in both the political and the policy world, and certainly I have as a lieutenant governor of my state of Maryland and as a national party chairman, um, the truth is that both good policy and good politics can work together to create the kind of programs and opportunities for communities. When you're productive, when you're positive, and when you provide evidence and information, the outcome for folks, certainly for those who's uh, on the receiving end of the benefit, as they say, uh, can be a very good thing. Taxpayers also get the biggest bang for their buck. Uh, and at the end of the day, that's what it's all about, right? service to the people and the communities in which we live. Uh, and to do that requires us to step up our game and bring the best to the table in how we look at solving those problems. And while it is often stated one has a right to their own views, it is also well stated and well known, you do not have the right to your own facts. Uh, you just can't make stuff up, all right, to prove your point. You just can't go out there and say whatever you think you feel about an issue. BPC's report released today focuses on Congress and possible ways it can build a culture of evidence to inform policymaking. Now, I know many in Congress support the expanded use of evidence instead of anecdote to craft public policy. And one of the best examples is the joint effort of Speaker Paul Ryan and Senator Patty Murray to advance the work of the Commission on Evidence Based Policymaking that made its recommendations last fall. BPC is continuing the Commission's work by bringing the Commission in-house and through its own evidence-based policy-making initiative. Also, the recently enacted Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018 includes several provisions for using evidence to better implement federal programs and to provide funding for gathering and coordinating evidence to inform decision-making. But building a culture of evidence in Congress will require a great deal of work. And that's the purpose of the BPC report being released today. So it is my pleasure to now turn this over to Sandy Davis, lead of the author on the report, and Tim Shaw, to highlight some of the ways Congress could build that culture of evidence and to equip itself in the data-driven world of the 21st century to make smart policy for the future and also to make a few smart policymakers. <laughs> Thank you very much. Come on up, guys. Well, thank you, Michael. I appreciate that very kind, generous introduction. Um, I am uh, I'm Sandy Davis. I'm a senior advisor here with the <clears throat> Bipartisan Policy Center. Um, joined with my colleague Tim Shaw, a senior policy analyst there uh, as well. And, and we're here today to talk to you all about this report we've been working on for a while on, on, on ideas for an advancing uh, an evidence-based culture uh, in Congress. Um, I'd also, before I start, like to particularly thank um, the Laura and John Arnold Foundation uh, for their support for this work. Uh, it's been instrumental in us being able uh, to do this, and we uh, really thank them for their support and uh, their counsel on, as we work through this. Um, <clears throat> in, this in, in this effort, um, 
what we've, what we've attempted to do um, is to take a, a broad look uh, at how Congress uses evidence uh, in the policymaking process and the ways to encourage greater use of that evidence. And of course, the underlying premise of all this is that evidence-based policymaking uh, or essentially the use of rigorous research to, on how policies and programs function, how they work, to inform decisions about how those policies and those programs should be structured or how they can be improved should be the basis for federal policymaking in the 21st century, regardless. It should be a fundamental basis for, uh, for policymaking. Now, our effort, uh, as, as, as Michael and Bill mentioned, sort of broadly paralleled that of the Commission on Evidence-Based Policymaking. Uh, the, the Commission, which, as we said, was made its final recommendations last fall, however, focused principally on uh, organizing and better structuring the use of data held by the executive branch, by the federal government. Um, our, our effort has focused uh, on a parallel effort uh, to suggest a set of ideas that's more appropriate for Congress in, in using the evidence that's, that's being generated and suiting it to the unique needs of, of the legislative branch. So in doing this, we had many conversations with key folks on Capitol Hill. Uh, two of whom are on the panel that you're going to listen to next. Uh, Ryan Martin and Holly Harvey were very instrumental in some early and ongoing conversations on practical uses for evidence uh, in Congress. And the, and the takeaway from, the, a broad takeaway from those conversations with them and with others is that there is a broad bipartisan support for expanding the use of evidence in the legislative process. And while it has been mentioned that there have been some significant ch achievements in incorporating evidence-based requirements in legislation, most recently in the Bipartisan uh, Budget Act of 2018, there are, we have discovered, some natural barriers uh, in the legislative process to the routine use of evidence to inform policymaking. We discussed those barriers um, broadly in volume one of, of our report, which was issued a couple of weeks ago, and it, copies of which are back there as well. And what we said in that in that volume was that these barriers sort of break up, uh, coalesce into three broad categories. Barriers about uh, the perception of the utility of evidence among lawmakers, whether or not it's valuable, whether or not it, it's, it makes sense to them and is usable in the legislative process. Then there's barriers within the institution of Congress, and how it's organized to function, its fragmented nature with fragmented committees of jurisdiction and, and its budget process which doesn't necessarily correspond with the way evidence is developed. And then there are systemic barriers that are related to sort of the norms, the conventions, the way Congress works, like the matching up the timing of legislation with the availability and, and use of evidence that, and research that's available. So while these are barriers, however, they do suggest a range of options um, and ideas that could encourage more consistent use uh, of evidence in, in Congress. And because we like the number three, we organize these into three broad buckets as well. <laughs> so these options fall, first of all, into options that we feel would build congressional capacity <clears throat> uh, to, to use evidence. Uh, options, in number two, that would modify its institutions to make that evidence more transparent to deal with the perception issue in particular. And then options to, to modify legislative procedures and processes more generally to incentivize the use of this evidence that's made available. Um, I'd like to, to, to make clear that these are options and not recommendations. Often BPC will issue a report with the task force making recommendations on a set of policies. We didn't do that uh, in this case. I think we felt like um, in this case a more helpful thing was to, to present a range of options that then lawmakers uh, could, could decide to, to move forward with if they chose in the most appropriate way depending upon how they use evidence. I mean, these are intended to be conversation starters, essentially. It doesn't cover everything, and I'm sure you all have lots of ideas and things. Why didn't you include this? Why didn't you include that? We'll talk a little bit more of that, about that in a minute, but, but these are conversation starters. And I think the broad principle behind this essential approach uh, is that because of the nature of Congress as an institution, um, creating a broad and consistent culture of evidence probably requires multiple approaches to deal with these multiple barriers. So without further ado, we're going to turn now to a discussion, give you an overview of, 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 of our set of options in the three categories. And I'm going to turn to my colleague Tim now to take on the task of talking about the, the options for capacity enhancement uh, and institutional modifications. Uh, 
that we thought of. And then I'm going to discuss some options about process changes that we think would also incentivize evidence use. So, Tim. Thanks, Sandy. Use. And uh, thank you all for coming. We're going to uh, do a, a broad overview of each of the sections. Obviously, we have 19 options in this volume, so not going to get into every one in particular. That will take too much time. But you all have copies of the report. Uh, but I'll start with uh, capacity options, give a broad overview of what they are, and highlight a few that we think are important either for the feasibility that, that we think could happen or that are, are a good demonstration of the type of option and the type of uh, problems we are looking to solve as, as, in, as part of the, the creation of these options. Uh, so first, a, an overview of the capacity options. These are really uh, designed to think through what could better facilitate Congress's ability to take in the evidence uh, that does already exist either in the research community or in the executive branch and, and build a better and easier pipeline to get that into the decision making process. And these options fall into to broadly into, into three buckets. Um, there's increasing the useful connections between Congress and researchers, which we heard a lot from our interviews about barriers uh, between those two institutions. Um, increasing the, the usefulness of the actual information that Congress has available and make sure it's tailored to the specific process uh, that, that Congress has to use to, to make decisions and make sure that information is the, uh, available at the right time. Timing was a big issue uh, that we heard. Um, and lastly, increasing the number of experts working for Congress and the training that staff are able to get in order to, to develop that expertise. Uh, this report is coming out at a time when the available resources and staffing available to Congress has been on a slow decline for, for quite some time. Um, and uh, congressional staff can attest they only have so many hours in a day to really dig into all of the really deep knowledge that's been built in the research community and in the executive branch around these issues. And so uh, really developing that staff capacity um, could, could help. Uh, we have a, a couple that we'd like to highlight. Um, and, and these try to balance a couple of key frustrations that we heard that were kind of dueling in the in the research and the, the congressional staff community. The first is that, like I said, there is there is a deep body of, of work that's done. Uh, the Commission on Evidence-Based Policymaking focused a lot on how we can better build evidence in the executive branch and what are the barriers to that. But that's not to say that a lot of good work and a lot of good research isn't already happening. Um, and, and for folks who are actually building that, when we talk to them, uh, who are building that evidence base, they were concerned about how to, to better get that evidence into congressional processes. So it wasn't always clear to them how to best do that and get it into the hands of decision makers to, to improve those decisions. On the flip side, though, congressional staff were, were off, uh, often talked about how, how to get that information in a useful form. Um, is the di diving into a, a peer-reviewed report for specific articles that might contain a bunch of a lot of jargon that might not be written specifically for policy recommendations is difficult, and it isn't well tailored to the process. It isn't, it isn't necessarily available on the time frame they need um, to make decisions, and so. The kind of the options that we have here uh, try to help address those two issues. The first I'll highlight is uh, our option for creating a congressional evidence fellowship program, um, and and we highlight this because we think a lot of good work has gone on in this area, and so there are good models for doing this in the future. The AAAS uh, fellowship program in particular is a good example of how these things have been run successfully. Elena Flanagan will be here on our second panel to talk through uh, her experience um, as a AAAS fellow. But we also think uh, establishing a specific congressional program uh, for evidence-based fellows would be uh, quite useful. Um, on top of the existing fellowships in a few ways. One, uh, tailoring the program to the congressional context and having Congress actually design the program could help help uh, Congress better fit it into the, the legislative process and time the fellowships at a point when it, they are going to be most useful to the process. Uh, second, uh, by its very nature, such a program would have to be bipartisan. So we are the Bipartisan Policy Center after all. And all these the fel private fellowships are a, kind of a grab bag from a, a lot of different places. And they can be placed into um, 
partisan offices, and there's no one kind of managing that process and making sure that that uh, members of all parties and, and committees sides of all parties have access to that level of expertise. This would help that it would also boost funding for that level of expertise in Congress. Again, it'd be important for these fellows to be timed specifically to legislation. And this is one of the key things that we think for all of these options it, um, is, is, is a key piece of uh, consider consideration, making sure that at the time the congressional staff can and need to call up someone who knows uh, that information, they have that person available um, and easily accessible. The second thing I want to highlight is uh, a much more difficult process uh, to, to undertake, but we also think could be high impact if it was executed well. And that's uh, establishing a, a protocol in the authorization process for including evidence uh, at, in a timely fashion from the executive branch, validating that information through uh, Congress's existing legislative service organizations, and then pairing that with some sort of extra expertise in the evidence process. That's a lot of moving parts, right? But we, we do think it's very important. Uh, in addition to the research community, the executive branch obviously uh, does a lot of work to build evidence for its programs and its decision making and, and works with Congress uh, regularly to, to make decisions. Uh, but again, all of those uh, all of that research isn't always well timed to the authorizations process. Um, it isn't. Uh, it's made by a set of decision makers that are, don't have the same consideration as the policymakers in Congress. And the idea here is when you start up the, when you're finishing up a, a, an authorization that you know is going to be reauthorized sometime later, that embedded in that uh, legislation, you create a timeline knowing that you're going to have to come to similar questions and request that the agencies provide some level of the evidence they've collected over the long term on the, the successful implementation the key insights from their research that they've been getting as part of uh, developing those programs and researching them and provide them to Congress at a time that, that would be useful. So we, uh, this would have to be uh, decided by committee staff. We're working on it closely. The kind of model we gave is two years ahead of a reauthorization, provide what level of evidence is available at that time. That evidence would then be passed through a validation process to the Government Accountability Office, is the group that we've suggested uh, as this option could do that. And this is in part because at any given time, um, obviously some congressional staff will be on the opposite party of the administration. There needs to be a way that, that Congress knows it can trust the information that's being passed from the executive branch to their hands and, and kind of really validate that process. And, and GAO is very, have, having worked there before, GAO is very well equipped to go in and talk to congressional staff of what their specific needs are. And they already have uh, rigorous processes for taking a look at underlying data, underlying studies, and validating them and coming up with and identifying the strengths of that, um, of the, the underlying research and evidence. Uh, that, that also then allows that research to be repackaged in a way that's specifically designed uh, for congressional use. So that step would be its own validation process, and the last would be hiring some sort of staff member who is an expert on these processes to be a facilitator in the, the last really, cr the crunch time for actually developing legislation uh, that can be a conduit between the committee staff, congressional staff, research institutions, and um, GAO to, to be on hand for the, the crafting of legislation and really fill out that process. That could happen in a number of ways. It would be good to partner with this fellowship program if it was in existence. GAO regularly sends detailees uh, or people on temporary assignment to committees that can, can support in this manner if it fits within their resource allocations and they're, they're given sufficient time uh, to, to make those determinations. And so we, we really see this as a way to, to fill in all the gaps that, that we identified. Um, a lot of the different options in this um, in this particular section, answer those questions in different ways. This one in particular, again, is a lot of moving parts, but kind of fills all the gaps that, that we see in, in that particular <coughs> process and can be very helpful. I move on briefly to the institutional part of our recommendations. And these are, these are places where we took a look at the, the actual structures in Congress and see whether and where there, there could be additions uh, to help uh, in the transparency of how evidence is used in decision making, um, as well as build up those structures to better facilitate the increase of evidence um, 
flow into Congress. The one I'll highlight here is an option for a, a joint committee on evidence. This one would be modeled after uh, the Joint Committee on Taxation or the Joint Economic Committee, and it would really be focused on uh, providing oversight of the executive branch's uh, evidence-based activities. In particular, we see a link here to the Commission's report. The Commission's report uh, recommended a number of processes uh, or and additions to executive branch agencies, such as chief evaluation officers and chief data officers that would oversee the evidence building uh, processes in Congress. And to, to signal that there's a, a good, good congressional oversight and support for these initiatives, uh, a joint uh, committee on evidence would oversee those activities and making sure they're, they're executed well um, and, and building the kind of evidence that, that we hope is incorporated well into uh, policy making decisions in the executive branch. It would also be helpful to get a sense from Congress as to the state, th their view and oversight on the state of evidence building in, in the executive branch on an annual basis and provide a natural pipeline of folks, uh, of senators and congressmen who are actively engaged on the issue of evidence building to provide that pipeline of leadership that is so important to make sure that evidence continues to be part of the culture of Congress. So those are the kind of high level uh, 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 options I wanted to highlight. I'll turn it back to Sandy to go over our process options. Thanks, Tim. <clears throat> so I'm just going to you know, briefly highlight some of the, the key process options we, we think worth focusing on. And then uh, in a few minutes, we'll, we'll open it up for questions before we turn to our uh, second panel. So for, for our looking at process changes, um, our broad thinking here and in talking to staff and others was that one of the key things you could do in modifying congressional process was the idea of sort of creating space for evidence uh, in the legislative agenda and the legislative timetable and, and schedule. Uh, and, and part of that also goes to aligning the legislative schedule more closely to evidence building uh, to enhance the opportunity for more comprehensive approaches to, to using evidence, to sort of separate it out somehow from the daily routine. Um, I think what also informed our thinking on this is, is, is the, the mere fact that Congress is, is really essentially a, a two-year institution. It goes, there are biennial elections, there are two sessions of Congress. And so I think that evidence generation and use needs to sort of accommodate itself to this kind of cycle of activity uh, in Congress. So the, 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 the ideas and options that are in the report that I wanted to focus on briefly are biennial budgeting, biennial evidence plans, uh, matching authorization cycles to the cycle of evidence, and portfolio reviews. So biennial budgeting, you may be thinking, well, what the heck has biennial budgeting got to do with evidence-based policymaking? <clears throat> Funny you should ask. Um, so the fundamental underpinning of biennial budgeting when you think about it is that all budgetary actions, appropriations, budget resolutions, spending and revenue legislation should occur in the first session or in, in a single session of Congress and that the other session of that Congress should be devoted principally to oversight, to authorizations, to broader policy questions. And this is the place where evidence is really most effective and most useful, is in that broader policy um, discussion and in that oversight discussion. Um, so biennial budgeting essentially would sort of create the space uh, that could be useful for a broader examination um, of evidence. And it's not necessarily that um, the evidence would mature or become available in, in, on a two-year cycle. That's not what we're saying, but having the expectation that there's a, a part of the legislative agenda, a separate session that's dedicated, that accommodates the, the evaluation of research and, and, and evidence in a legislative setting, I think is an important signal to send about the priority for evidence-based policymaking in Congress. I think this also supports the notion, um, the long-standing notion, uh, under congressional procedures that, that policy decisions really should be separate <clears throat> from budgetary decisions. Uh, the long-standing tradition of, of separate authorizations and appropriations, going back to the very beginning of the Republic, establishes the broad concept that, that policy should be made first and then the funding decisions should follow from that. Um, and this is also the case with evidence when you, when you think about it. The key questions for using evidence uh, evidence-based policymaking is, is how programs can be structured or improved uh, based on good research, and then that the funding decisions should then be made based on this information. Um, so biennial evidence plans. <clears throat> biennial evidence plans for authorizing committees is, is, is a new idea that we uh, developed. 
And this would also pair with the rhythm uh, of a two-year Congress and a biennial budget approach. And this option uh, calls for authorizing committees at the beginning of a Congress to develop an evidence or research, an evidence and research plan uh, that would identify some of the key research uh, questions for upcoming oversight activities, for upcoming authorizations, either in that Congress or in future Congresses. It could be a rolling plan where it's updated periodically for new research. And the authorizing committees are really the natural, as Tim alluded to, the natural focus uh, for evidence use in Congress. They have the jurisdiction over the programs, they focus on policy, and they have sort of a longer view than is typical in the annual appropriations process. But recent breakdowns in the authorization process, as, as CBO annually chronicles in its report on unauthorized appropriations, uh, is keeping those committees really from a more systematic of oversight and effective use of evidence. So, and part of the disconnect, we feel like, is that the interest of members and the questions that members ask uh, are somehow disconnected to the relevant research on the issues um, and that, that they are dealing with and legislation that's upcoming. Not in all cases, but I think as a general rule, there tends to be this sort of disconnect. So routine evidence plans could begin to sort of fill that gap and better connect committees and their priorities to, to the, the available evidence. This is admittedly a tough assignment for committee staff who some folks here can already attest are really way too busy with their current duties. Um, and it's also the case that, you know, that there's a danger here that uh, this could become a partisan exercise uh, for one side or the other in the committee structure. So that is something that has to be watched out for and perhaps pairing this up with one of the, you know, capacity enhanced enhancing plans that uh, for legislative support agencies that Tim discussed might be the way to go. But having authorizers vested in this seems to be an important, uh, important uh, advance for the use of evidence. Briefly, um, this, we have an idea for, we think that it's important that, that authorizing legislation itself, the cycle of reauthorizations, be, matter, be better matched up to the cycle of evidence that's generated. And, and this really alludes back to what Tim was talking about for infusing the authorization process uh, with more evidence on a routine basis. Uh, authorizations for many programs are done on a multi-year basis, three to five years for many programs like education, for housing, for job training, uh, a range of programs have multi-year authorizations. And so if committees were more intentional about matching the those cycles with the generation of evidence that Tim was talking about, that would help to sort of establish, again, the expectation that evidence would be used on a routine basis to support legislation. It's not the case that you can match all authorization cycles with evidence generation. There are many factors driving cycles of authorization. Uh, accountability uh, short, maybe, may require shorter cycles than is implied by the evidence. But as a general rule, trying to match legislative activity with that cycle of evidence uh, is key. Finally, I want to briefly mention a, a, a sort of a different idea, and that is the idea of a portfolio review of policies on an evidence-based um, basis uh, in the legislative process. Portfolio review is an opportunity for sort of a more comprehensive approach uh, to applying evidence in the legislative process, in particular to, to overcome the barriers of the, the separate and uh, fragmented committee jurisdictions uh, and, the, and the standard budget structure that we see in the budget resolution. In a portfolio review, um, these broad portfolios such as education, poverty reduction, uh, infrastructure investment that cut across committee jurisdictions would be examined uh, in sort of a comprehensive review. Um, and an important component of such a review would, would be that um, an evidence-based analysis of how these programs are working in conjunction with one another. And the evidence would go out beyond the bounds of the usual structures of these committees um, and establish a strategy for perhaps organizing these programs more effectively, uh, not in line with their, with their current structures. This, is a, this would be a heavy lift because it implies a broader restructuring of, of some jurisdictions or going around those jurisdictions in Congress and doing things differently than is normally done. But it does at least um, underscore the importance of leadership in advancing sort of a broader uh, evidence agenda for Congress and the idea that often the most relevant uh, and critical evidence is, does not exist within the silos or the bounds of a particular agency or committee jurisdiction, but is more effective if it's, if it's broadened beyond those restrictions. So I think, um, before I turn it over to questions here, I just think in conclusion, I think the broader point for us in doing all of this is that 
in our efforts to sort of cr uh, create the premise that Congress should be an evidence-based institution, I think to create that culture of, of evidence-based based policy making in Congress, you've got to have strong capacity. You've got to have institutions modified to sort of make the evidence more transparent and create the routines through the legislative process that will, will make the use of evidence both a priority and a regular part of legislating. Um, so with that, uh, we're running a little bit behind, but we have a, a few minutes for some questions. Uh, I'll turn it over to you guys. Any questions about our options or more broadly about the report that we've worked on? Um, um, yes, we have one. Uh, we have, uh, so we have someone with a mic. Natalie, and if you would um, identify yourself and who you're with, can you ask the question? Hi, uh, I'm Samira Daniels, uh, Ramsey Decision Theoretics. Uh, I've been interested in this subject for an awfully long time, uh, g given the intelligence uh, situ uh, um, uh, pronouncements that we've uh, had to contend with. Uh, the, the, when you, s you touched on it slightly about the structures, and I'm wondering to what extent it, this would also require a real, uh, almost a marketing uh, to the senators and you know the Congress who are you know have been here a long time, and I'm wondering uh, that, that it's that it's that conversation, and I'm wondering how you start that conversation and what reception you've had up to this point for that. Well, I'll take a stab, and, and um, I, I think that's, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think that I think that there's broad agreement. We've had all these conversations, and 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 there is enthusiasm across the board, um, in both sides, uh, for applying evidence more broadly. I think the the fact that Speaker Ryan and Pat and Senator Murray came together in their budget committee roles initially to the conclusion that evidence uh, should be a foundation for uh, for the policy decisions we make, whatever those policies may be, they should be carried out as effectively as possible. Um, I think, you know, the difficulty comes then when you try to operationalize that. And that's when you really need, um, you know, strong, hopefully bipartisan leadership to take on specific legislative initiatives. I mean, I don't want to, uh, you know, a, a perfect example is um, in the HELP Committee in the Senate, uh, work on uh, education. Uh, reauthorizations between Senator Alexander and Senator Murray uh, was critical to incorporating evidence-based initiatives uh, in the education reauthorization. Um, I'm going to call out my friend Ryan Martin right here, who's been involved in lots of legislative initiatives in Ways and Means in particular uh, on, on a range of, of programs that embed evidence, um, but it's, it requires a sort of targeted leadership. Uh, and I think that those are just, you know, that's why the thrust of our, our ideas are around building capacity and incorporating it into the routines. And the idea that it's sort of a long-term effort. Um, and, and that to be successful, it, it cannot ignore the politics, as Michael Steele referred to. It has to sort of live with the politics and have a seat at the table. Um, Tim, maybe? Yeah, no? that's good. So it's, but it's, it's an ongoing effort, yes. It's right here. Uh, this okay. lady right here had a question, and then Pete. <laughs> Hi, Stacy Bridges, Veterans Vision. Um, with all the evidence that you do have, what if it conflicts with um, political agenda or special interest agenda? Uh, you can have all the evidence in the world, but a strong wrong beats a, a weak right <laughs> any day. So what does party and agenda play with evidence? And, and accepting the fact versus alternative facts. I mean, I th I, yeah. sure. Um, I, I think we might be naive to say that that politics don't play a role in these decisions, and, and that Congress is, is a political body. I think as part of the underlying assumption of any evidence based policy making uh, initiative you have to understand that the evidence is going to have it needs to have a seat at the table and that's mostly this is what we're trying to to push here is the best options for congress to make sure that evidence has a seat at the table and that's not a guarantee that it's always going to win um, and we would we would like it to to be the case that you know 
everyone always agreed uh, that the underlying facts led to certain conclusions. That's just not going to be the case. And so our hope is that we can, we can help strengthen the processes that, that allow evidence to play a greater role in decision making, but that's not going to get rid of the, the concerns that, that you just outlined. It's, it, and, and in some cases, rightfully so. They, this is a political institution for a reason. Folks are listening to their constituents and their concerns, and, and they need to reflect that. Pete, you got a question? Hi, uh, Pete Fontaine. I'm currently with uh, George Washington University, formerly CBO. I'd like you, if you could say a little bit more about how you think this biennial uh, budgeting process would work. Um, and in particular, I, I guess I would start with the observation that you might say we already de facto have a biennial process <laughs> uh, where, you know, the, since 2011, the Congress right. has done a series of two-year fixes looking at caps and then, you know, come back to it two years later. So, and then in off years, not having a budget resolution as may be the case this year. So I'm wondering how in that sort of reality of how the right. Congress is working, you would see this option and this idea playing out. Right. Um, well, full disclosure, Pete and I worked for many years together at CBO, <clears throat> so we've had some discussions like this. Um, and it's a, it's a very good question because you're right. We have essentially have had two-year budget agreements going back to about 2013, I guess. Um, and that's in part what, you know, sort of informs for me uh, that a broader application of a biennial approach may be successful because we have the underpinnings now on the basis of these two-year agreements of a solid biennial budget cycle. However, it, that doesn't mean that it's easy to do because what we've now got is essentially a continuous budgeting cycle with delay and, uh, you know, ongoing use of continuing resolutions. It's, it's as if the, the funding and the budgeting process never ends, and so all attention's focused on that. Um, I think, you know, it's one thing to say we should have a biennial budget process, and I think that we should have a biennial budget process. Sticking to those boundaries um, is, a, is a tougher issue. Um, um, it could be that th there would have to be some procedural changes to sort of enforce this that have to be uh, a focus on the appropriations process to somehow try to create a discipline that would call for it to be finished in a given session uh, and actually set aside for authorizations, it wouldn't be easy. I think ultimately it requires leadership. It requires leadership, bipartisan leadership, uh, I think to sort of really set the tone that you've got a, a, a successful biennial approach that, that drills down to the legislative level, uh, not just two-year targets for discretionary spending, but drills down to the legislative level. Um, it, it's not, it's, it would not be easy, but I think it would be a much more effective way to legislate. Um, I think we should, is there one more question back there? Uh, we'll take one more question and I think we should to try to stay on track and turn over to our next panel. Hi, Amanda Myers. Um, I'm with the Military Officers Association of America. Um, you said earlier that policy decisions should be made first and funding decisions should be made second. And this is obviously sort of an ideal because right. The political reality yeah. is that, um, as, as my colleague said earlier, I, yeah. even if you have all the best evidence in the world, um, you still may not be able to argue for legitimate policy changes. And frankly, the, the policy discussions almost exclusively these days center around funding um, and whether or not funding is available for whatever policy initiatives you may have in mind. Right. So, with that in mind and these realities, uh, how would you say that evidence-based practitioners should argue for their evidence to be used better or to create a culture shift to accomplish these sort of ideals in policy making? I mean, I, I would just say uh, just briefly that um, you know, part of our thinking in this report was that we had a range of options, some of them are more difficult to implement than others. Um, and part of what we're also talking about is sort of a culture change. Uh, it's not something that might necessarily happen overnight, um, but something that will require, I think ultimately, like with biennial budgeting, require uh, leadership to make these things a priority. I, I think that some of it bubbles up from, uh, from the good work that's already being done in some of the committees of Congress, uh, where you've got um, a focus on particular programs that are particularly um, uh, 
uh, useful for, for evidence-based policymaking. I think just uh, making it part of the routines uh, slowly uh, is it's not um, simple, but I think making it a part of the routines through this process is, is what's called for. And, and quickly, I think you had asked about how to in, inject evidence into the existing process and not so much about um, the, the, this ideal process that, that we've described. Um, and, and so I would also say that the second panel will be a really good place to ask that question because a lot of these folks have worked on that exact issue. Um, and that the uh, AAAS also came out with a report recently about specifically targeting how, how scientists can better uh, tailor their work to, to the policymaking process. So I, I'd check that out. Perfect segue. So we are now going to turn over to our, our second panel, and I'm going to turn over to my colleague Dan Blair, Senior Counselor at BPC, to get that, go, get that ball rolling. Invite our other panelists to come on up. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dan Blair, <clears throat> and in my present iteration, I'm the Senior Counselor and Fellow at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Uh, like a cat, I've had many past lives, and one of those was being the President and CEO of the National Academy of Public Administration, um, a congressionally chartered organization that had a, a broad interest in this topic. I ran two federal agencies, the Postal Regulatory Commission and the Office of Personal Management. And I think what was relevant to this panel was I spent 17 years on the Hill in both the House and the Senate on the House um, Government Reform and Oversight Committee, as it was called at the time, and the Senate Governmental Affairs Committee. And during that time, we've had a, we had a number of government reforms enacted, and it seems to me that this evidence agenda is part of that iteration. We had the CFO Act in the early 90s. We had the Government Performance and Results Act. We had Klinger Cohen. We had FISMA or GIZMA and FISMA. We've had the uh, government, uh, GPRA uh, number, iteration number two about 10 years ago. And it really is this progression of looking at how to improve government performance. And that's really what evidence-based decision-making is all about. So Sandy, I appreciate the invitation to be here today and the good work that you and Tim just described in the options, and the key word there is the options, that this paper presents for Congress to consider in implementing and importantly institutionalizing the evidence agenda as it applies to oversight and legislation. Now we're going to hear from three experts on the ground here to my left who have real life experience in evaluating and moving legislation, and their views on how the use of evidence can not only strengthen the legislative and oversight process, but can be institutionalized for current and future congressional use. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Elena Flanagan, Holly Harvey, and Ryan Martin. All three panelists have unique and real world perspectives and experience in addressing the use of evidence in the oversight and legislative process. We will hear from our three panelists first, then begin a moderated panel discussion followed by audience questions and answers. Then we'll conclude the panel discussion with final observations by the three panelists. By way of background, Dr. Elena Flanagan is a science and technology policy fellow with the American Association for the Advancement of Science. I heard that referred to as the Triple AS Fellowship. And Dr. Flanagan is currently placed with the US Congress Joint Economic Committee and with the Democratic staff. Holly Harvey recently retired from her position as one of two deputies in the Budget Analysis Division. Is that acronym really bad? Yes. <laughs> at, the, at the Congressional <laughs> Budget Office. As deputy, Holly was a leader for health policy analysis at CBO during a decade of turbulent activity where she managed a team of dedicated professionals to produce independent, timely analysis to support congressional consideration of healthcare legislation. And rounding out the panel today is Ryan Martin, 
Ryan serves as the Senior Human Services Advisor for Senator Orrin Hatch of Utah, and Senator Hatch chairs the Senate Finance Committee. Ryan advises the committee on critical issues involving the development and advancement of legislation to reduce poverty, protecting children, improving maternal child and child health, and ensuring social programs achieve results. And before joining the committee on in 2017, Ryan worked on a similar legislative and oversight portfolio for the House Ways and Means Committee. So why don't we begin with our, dis our panel discussions. I had the opportunity to have a phone call with uh, the panel last week and also to kind of share some thoughts and questions with them. So you kind of know what's going to be coming, but I might throw a little, little curveball in there. Uh, one of the things that, that Sandy and Tim talked about was really institutionalizing the evidence agenda in Congress. And I know how busy staff and members are how do you introduce this to them and how do you educate them on the importance of the options that are presented in this paper and the overall evidence agenda? How do you make them advocates for that or at least believers? I'll start with you, Dr. Flanagan. Sure. So, um, you know, as a fellow, I'm here more as a researcher and also to learn about the legislative process. Um, you know, AAAS's model is to uh, take researchers from a variety of sciences and engineering and you know place them in both congressional offices as well as, as exec executive branch offices um you know so this is kind of our a lot of our first exposure to the legislative process to how our research might be used and it is two part um part of that is learning you know how do we better get our research out there learning you know how can we you know, take what we're doing in our labs, take what we're doing in our own studies, and let that be useful. So, you know, we've seen the briefing model tends to be, you know, kind of this form right here of we need to take our research, we need to make it really digestible, we need to, you know, be seeing who is working on legislation that's relevant to our research. Um, you know, what other organizations are out there that might benefit from our research that already have relationships built that we can get our research to. So, you know, that briefing model and a better outreach model, uh, the research community sees that as really important. Dr. Flanagan, is there anything particular in your background that that brings this issue to your interest, and what do you think would be good to share with the audience today about that? Sure. So um, from a program evaluation perspective, I think it's really important to consider the systems approach. You know, so we, we have evidence, we have research, but, you know, it's really important to consider how that's used and who needs it and how they can benefit from it. Um, you know, we have a lot of programs out there, you know, that we are researching their effectiveness and, you know, trying to see is it working, is it not working, is it working, you know, how we, how we think it's supposed to, are there other effects? And, you know, beyond just the research on the outcome of the program, you also need to consider the people in that program, the people who are working within that program, the people who are organizing that program, and the people who make decisions about that program. So, you know, the outreach is really part of that, of, you know, that whole systems model of evaluating programs, of looking at the people that are involved in each step in that program. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Harvey, what, what makes you, you, what gives you your unique perspective on making this or institutionalizing evidence as part of the legislative process? And if you were going to just kind of give some key points today, what would you want to, the audience to hear about this as we go into more questions and answers with the panel and with the audience? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, I, I love evidence, I must say. I, I kind of chuckle to myself a little bit uh, when I think, uh, I did two tours, as we like to say, at CBO. Uh, one back in the late 80s, early 90s, then I left. And in fact, I left CBO saying, you know, darn it, <laughs> I'm going to go out and help people produce the information that's needed to do cost <laughs> estimates because there's all this information I need that doesn't exist. And so I've kind of been pursuing the idea of getting the right information for uh, policymakers to use uh, my whole career. Um, I would say that since that time, the amount of information that's available the and the sophistication, if you will, of the ways of analyzing data have grown exponentially, which is great on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's very hard to get a grip on, on what's out there. So um, I know myself, um, even though I had a whole staff 
uh, trying to understand when some new thing came along, what's the state of the evidence, what do we know, what do we not know, quickly was not that easy. So um, my biggest thought <laughs> um, it, in terms of um, getting evidence to be more broadly used is to make it as easy as possible, both for members, decision makers, but importantly, I think, for staff. I'm mostly sympathetic to staff. Um, because uh, I only, granted, health is a big area, but I was only dealing with one area, and most staff, of course, are dealing with multiple areas in the portfolio, and to try to keep track of all the different things going on, I think, is really difficult. And um, so, uh, figuring out ways um, to convey information on one sheet of paper with pictures where possible, and I don't mean that in a patronizing way, I mean good graphs mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, can convey information much more quickly, that I think, to people and help them. It's more actionable sometimes. Um, Ryan, do you want to Kind of, I gave you a brief description of your background, but is there anything that you wanted to share with the audience uh, on a deeper dive about what your interest is in evidence and how you would go about educating um, members and staff on the importance of this and incorporating it into the decision-making process when it comes to legislating and oversight? Sure, and I can definitely talk a little bit about how Congress has done that in a few instances as well, but definitely thanks to the Bipartisan Policy Center for putting this report together. I know we meet with a lot of people who talk about we should use more evidence and we should do evidence-based policy, but having actually pen to paper and coming up with some specific ideas, um, you know, the longer list the better because then there's a menu of options that people can look at and dig into, so it's great to have that. Um, I have to give my disclaimer that I'm sharing my own views and not speaking for Chairman Hatch or for members of the committee, although I try and divine their interests all the time and uh, meet with them frequently to understand what their interests are. But um, in the summer of 2013, the Atlantic published an article that was written by a former senior Obama administration official and Bush administration official that wrote, based on our rough calculations, less than one dollar out of every 100 of government spending is backed by even the most basic evidence of the money is being spent wisely. Um, and I think there's a broad bipartisan interest that we can get more for what we're spending today. Um, you know, for getting setting this sort of deficit type discussion, um, there's an understanding that we're spending various amounts across the government on all sorts of different social, you know, domestic social issues, and we can have a much better impact for those resources. And I think there's a few things that are moving in this direction that I think are really indicative of where we'll be able to go and how we've seen some progress already. First is, outside of government, you see um, investors and Right, and that becomes the law and everyone does that. Uh, we're shifting more toward a process where there becomes agreement on an area that they would like to impact, and then the specifics of what the policy might be or the program or how it's run is left up to the state or the local agency. So just a couple of examples of that in my world. One is called the Family First Prevention Services Act, where states are going to be able to receive money to prevent kids from coming into foster care. And that law doesn't say what program run, it says substance abuse, mental health, and in-home parenting supports. There will be evidence-based programs in those areas that the states can select from. So that's one example. Um, the Maternal Infant and Early Childhood Home Visiting Program, another one, where HHS has developed a list of, I think, 16 programs that meet their sort of seal of approval for evidence. States can select among those. So again, that's a desire of addressing maternal child health, addressing child abuse, but not fighting over what the solution is. Um, agreeing instead on what the overall goal should be. Um, and then I think 
the one challenge I'll close is evaluate and then what? Um, I think the crossroads that we're at in a lot of these cases is on, on extremes we've seen, I mean, I've, I've been, not since I've been here, but done research on this looking at evidence where there's been multiple studies done of showing it's not effective and Congress has barred further evaluation of Graham. Um, we don't want to do that. Uh, on the other end, there's concern that an evaluation will show something's not effective and it will just be cut and ended. And so I think going again back to that sort of thematic approach instead of if there's a focus to deal with early childhood education, when you find a program that's not successful, you just try another one. Um, when the policy is we're going to fund this program and you get an evaluation back that says it doesn't work, you have this sort of existential crisis where people are worried about evaluation um, because they don't want to be in that point where they're stuck one way or the other. But it's always been my thought on this is when the evidence comes back that it's not working, some will say let's end it, others will say this is an opportunity to refine it and make it better and actually get the results that's in, you know, that are intended by the program. And so you know, in, in looking at that, in looking at the report that we just issued, what, do you see any low-hanging fruit that Congress might move on that in a bipartisan manner that could be adopted? Do you see, pro, you know, in, what could be easiest in adopting? I know that Sandy was talking about earlier, he, he and I th wrote this down because I thought it was really important uh, that we wanted to create space in the legislative cycle for evidence. So are, did any of these options that are described in this paper capture your attention if we wanted to create that kind of space in the legislative cycle? I, I can start and think of a couple. Um, I actually really like the evidence fellowship idea, partly um, after moving from the House to the, I spent about seven years on the House and then just came over to the Senate. Um, I was really surprised how many fellows and interns and things there are in the committee offices and with the members. Um, I don't know if that's sort of just the universe I'm in on the finance committee or if that's more broadly, but it seems like I've been to a lot of meetings and things where there's other, um, pro and you know, not just younger interns as well, but professional fellows who were sort of taking a sabbatical and coming and, and working on the Hill and learning these things. So I think, uh, and they do add a lot of capacity to sort of take a step away from the politics, look at the details and kind of come up with more ideas. Uh, and I've seen that, you know, on both sides, Republican and Democrat on the Senate side. Uh, the second one, I, I really like the simple idea of the CBO expiring programs list. Um, you know, that's kind of a radar of here's some things that are upcoming and just having that be a further year out, I think could be interesting just to get people's attention. I know this is sort of a ritualistic review of that document when it comes out, right? And so having those other things on there, I think could be really helpful. Thank you. I'm kind of dividing this question up into two sections or two parts because I'm saying, what would be low hanging fruit but also what would be priorities in your opinion? So Holly or Elena, do you wanna comment on that? What you think might be low hanging fruit and then we can talk about what maybe the priorities are and what the common ground or nexus might be there. So I think um, the, the option to establish the um, database of evidence-based programs um, is, is a really good one because that's something you know that we've seen in legislation that already exists. So McPhee, the, the um, maternal, infant, and early childhood home visiting program is a good example that has you know kind of a range of programs that we know are established and that work. Um, and that also has the benefit of showing what is the standard of evidence that Congress would like. And you know, as other programs are you know trying to, to meet that level or have an idea of what sort of research, if we are you know, wanting to prove that a program is effective or if we're wanting to highlight some of the aspects of a good program, what does that look like? Um, you know, how can we replicate that with some other evaluations that we're doing? So you know, just establishing that database would be really good. And I think that with some of the, you know, with, with CRS, you know, there, there are some existing structures or you know, doing that Congressional Fellows Program, um, that would you know, be something that's pretty easy to do with exist, um, existing structures that we have. Thank you. Holly? Yep, I would uh, second that point, the, the database thing, in part because um, it, it feeds into like my main point, which is make it easy, as easy as possible. And so if somebody's looking to uh, say they want to add in to authorizing legislation, evidence, you know, incentives for evidence-based stuff, then that's a model for them to go to. I. Uh, I mean, I think the CBO report extension, hopefully none of my 
current colleagues or former colleagues are here. I think that's like the lowest hanging fruit in the world. <laughs> um, I really don't think the marginal cost is very high at all of, of doing that. And, and in fact, well, whatever. I don't have to spend a lot of time on that. But uh, another idea that I actually really like and that I think um, could over time really feed into creating this culture of evidence is uh, is the idea of the CRS, uh, whatever it is, option two here, sorry, the training for congressional staff. I think there is a lot of staff turnover, although Ryan's an example of some of that turnover is, is just moving chairs. So, um, but nevertheless, kind of establishing a sort of base language and approach to the use of evidence and policy making, particularly with entering staff, but even on an ongoing basis, I think would help make the database more useful and would help if leadership, you know, starts exerting pressure on those goals, then the staff have to know how to implement it. So I think a lot can be done with that and not only sort of a one-time training, but then have it as a webinar so that when then staff actually need to use that, they can go back and look at it or a slide deck or a toolkit. I mean, there's all this stuff that can go with training now that's not just one seminar session, and, and I think that that could be um, helpful for, like I said, generating a common language. I think one of the, you know, there is always this fear that a bad evaluation will lead to a sort of knee-jerk cancellation of a program or that there will be a bad evaluation and nothing will happen, and so what's the point? But I think creating more, um, a more kind of uh, sophisticated approach to what is evidence and what it can do for us broadly among the Congress uh, is a good idea in terms of um, uh, people are often afraid it's like if it's not all good, they don't want to talk about it. <laughs> and if it's not all absolutely perfect, randomized, controlled trial, they don't, they're afraid to put it out there. And so um, being transparent about where there's evidence, where there isn't, what it's useful for, and how it should be applied, and having that be a common part of discussions instead of sort of the weapon of one side or the other in a policy, in a political uh, context, I think would be really helpful. You, you mentioned a key term in there, and you said weapon, and I've heard, th heard this described as, you know, one of the things to guard against is, and I'm stealing this term from him, is the weaponization of evidence. And how do you guard against that? To me, it's like riding a bicycle without the training wheels. You know, you can always fall and you're always going to have that threat. But that doesn't mean that you can't ride the bicycle. So what, how do you, what, what kind of, how do, how do you, you can't prevent it, but how do you address it? How do you, um, how do you work, how do you work that into your plan to make sure that um, even with that looming out there that, that Congress still has the evidence and the facts and the resources necessary before it, even if it wants to make a bad decision? Well, yeah, well, decision, I mean, well, one person's bad decision might be another one's good decision. <laughs> but but uh, I th this, the, uh, the idea, the only thing I can think of in terms of trying to mitigate the weaponization issue is if it's more commonly understood that um, we're not going to have perfect evidence and perfect information for any policy, never nor is any policy that's implemented ever going to work exactly as Congress anticipated. Never. Well, let's just say that. <laughs> you know? And then when someone wants to say, but it's not working perfectly, they said, yeah, it's not working perfectly. What's your idea to improve it? That, I mean, like I said, that's kind of naive, mm -hmm. but that's all I can think of. And I think, I, I think that's why um, I've mentioned a few times already sort of the idea of Congress agreeing upon an issue that needs to be addressed and not a policy tool to achieve it, right? Because mm -hmm. if the agreement uh, is like we had across the House and the Senate to reduce child abuse and neglect or, or reduce the number of kids in foster care, 
there's, it's a little more agnostic as to what that is, and you can have something that doesn't work and still survive because you can just do something different, right? Um, I'm a big fan, and I, I haven't really seen this in government programs, but of A-B testing, of saying, we're gonna do this thing, let's try this version of it and this version of it and see which one ends up getting us closer to where we wanna be. Um, and then that way you're sort of building in a natural failure anyway, um, and so it's not a surprise to people that like all their eggs in one, one basket. Um, so, you know, it's kind of the private sector idea of, you know, failing fast, trying lots of things. Um, I know the Arnold Foundation has been big prior to the um, Coalition on Evidence-Based Policy, Coalition for Evidence-Based Policymaking, talking about how many trials there are in the private sector, whether it be drug trials or private sector business trials, and how many of those things they go through until they find something that works. And then even when something does work, it may only work for a few years, and then you need to do something different. Um, we don't have that culture and that comfort in government, and, and sometimes because it is that sort of personal pet project, and I don't mean that in a bad way, I just mean someone is passionate about something, they come from a background, they understand it, and they really, really wanna see that happen. Um, and so if we can, sort of like in a negotiation, if you can get away from the actual disagreement and move back to the underlying interests and, and try and facilitate that instead, I think you can survive some of those instances better. Can I follow on that? Oh, please. Because I love this idea. Um, I think that um, the other thing this avoids is winners and picking winners and losers. One of my favorite um, parts of the commission's report about evidence-based policy making was the need for humility, uh, which I think is, is very strong. I think even when you have really good, solid evidence, there's still context to that evidence that may not be applicable, certainly nationally, or may not be applicable over time. And so the idea that you know, you've got this one and done, there's evidence, we know what works, and we're done, that's implicit if you're picking a winner, like of the array of things that have been tried in states, if you're gonna pick one and make that the federal policy, I think that's, um, that's probably a, not going to lead to as many good outcomes as letting people work within a framework of not letting them waste money on things that everybody's tried and don't work, but but um, uh, allowing people to figure out what will work best for the what they know about on the ground. And I think um, you know some of the we have a few models for those in some of the some of our program and funding structure. So the idea of promising practices, you know, the idea of it's a little bit of that A/B testing of you know we have things that are established, but we have things that maybe we don't have as much evidence about them as we would like. But you know we're trying to to build that evidence base, or you know we acknowledge that maybe this program works for you know this certain population in this certain context. Um, but you know that kind of builds in a little bit of that variety while still maintaining the consensus statements that the community is said about, you know, like we know that these are the important parts of a program, but, you know, beyond that, you might be piecing together other little elements that work better for some and not others. One of the, looking out on the horizon and how, how to move these kinds of options and concepts into reality, one of the things that, that, that struck me was that <coughs> Congress has created this new joint selected committee on budget and appropriations process. And can this select committee play a role in supporting consideration and or adoption of these kinds of options? And what kind of, you know, I don't know how familiar you might be with this, but is this something that, that actually could be a catalyst towards moving Congress in the right direction when it comes to the evidence agenda? Well, defer to my, panel, my fellow panelists. <laughs> I just was looking at option one here. It says develop a protocol for systematic evidence and program authorizing. Um, and I think we've had some success in legislation recently uh, in a few places creating um, clearing houses, uh, tiered evidence grants, things like that, so that it's more built into the, just the way the program operates. Um, I joke a lot of times the way to make this successful is have it be the last section of every bill, right? It's not the big front page thing that's getting all the attention. It's just this is what we do, this is the normal process. And so that's something that I've worked on a lot is trying to make it easier to make the jump for people who want to do evidence to actually looking and saying, well, here's an example, here's an example, here's an example, so that it would just become second nature where that, that timing would be aligned. Uh, and I think that couples with one of the other recommendations in here that talks about um, collaborating with the executive branch where you know, mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of times you have these sort of two spheres moving independently um, and the more you can project ahead what the needs might be and have the research shop sort of preparing things that will answer questions that legislators might have, I think you, the more you get in that sort of cycle uh, of having that inform uh, 
the discussions more than just, you know, two weeks ahead, they find out there's a markup and they have to like, you know, everyone runs for the, the internet to try and find what they can find and meet with whoever they can meet with um, and get the answers, so, yeah. A little bit of reality there. <laughs> Uh, well, obviously, some of the things like the biennial budgeting and stuff are, are ripe for consideration by the <laughs> Joint Commission. What will actually happen, I don't know. Um, I do think um, I, I don't know, well, I don't know how, um, so I think more of the institutional things on the bottom are, are and, and potentially, you know, uh, I suppose, I don't know if as part of the budget process people want to start putting requirements in the components of authorization bills, but theoretically they could. Uh, one of the things I thought would be kind of interesting um, that goes with your option 14 about maintaining sort of an evidence base um, when legislation comes forward, you've got the sort of whole package of the hearings and and all the evidence that has come along, which honestly I laugh about because uh, sadly so much over the past few years of uh, key legislation did not have hearings and did not follow regular order. So I had a funny little idea because some people believe if you measure it and count it that people will pay more attention to it. Of um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the congress.gov page and when you're con looking at a bill, right, then there's all these different tabs. Well, you could kind of have a tab number one that takes you to evidence. But I also wondered, um, and this is another thing for our friends at CRS to take on, um, <laughs> whether there could be a kind of template-y sort of thing that got filled out about whether a piece of legislation, you know, had had hearings, if there had been evidence made public about the policy that was being considered, and if so, you know, in what venue or whatever, something that would let you kind of give things even a score. <laughs> and over time, that would build up, you know, and could add to this kind of uh, database of how much evidence is used in policy making. And, and again, over time, uh, you know, sort of start documenting uh, whether Congress is walking the walk, <laughs> if you will. And I don't know uh, if that would be most appropriately considered as part of the Joint Commission's work or whether that would kind of come through in some of these other ideas. But wouldn't kind of the restoration of the regular order <laughs> bring that in <laughs> in a natural way? It could. It could. With hearings and committee reports and uh, hearing reports and and those that kind of documentation, um, you know, with the CBO report in there. Right. Well, it could, and, and Ryan should speak to this also. I mean, I, I, because I spent so much of my time working on health and in health, there are a lot of sort of program authorization bills and that sort of thing, but there's also a lot of bills um, that are a conglomeration of a bunch of policies. Some of those policies might have had individual hearings over time, but I think it's rare that a large healthcare bill that's got a bunch of policies that are spending money and then often a bunch of policies that are saving money so that you come out uh, deficit neutral or you're hitting whatever Congress's budgetary goal is, it would be unusual if each piece of that big bill had uh, a package that demonstrated the evidence that had been considered for that particular policy as part of congressional considerations. And that may be asking a lot of, of a process that moves pretty fast. Yeah. And I think, so, my prior role, I was mostly in the human services role. Now I'm part of a broader health team, and so I get to see a lot of the health discussions and things like that. And it also makes me think, and, and sort of making a point about finding the right balance between how much Congress is looking at evidence and using institutions and others is, you know, I don't think we want to get to the point where sort of like Congress is voting on each cancer drug approval, right? Mm -hmm. It's like the staff are going through the studies and they're saying like, oh, you know, was it really random? And do they, did they, you know, was this like intent to treat or how was it? And, you know, going through all this sort of stuff and then having a discussion and a vote on that. And I, and I think there can be a danger of 
building up the legislative branch so much with that intent in mind saying, okay, well, here's all the information, so go ahead and decide and do that. And so that's why I'm definitely a fan of sort of the institutions or setting up the framework for these types of things. We've done this in legislation by creating what works clearinghouses or other things too, where there is insight and input at the congressional level, but it's not this sort of overwhelming detail level of getting into the all the different studies and trying to divine what those answers are. Uh, but sort of setting up a process where there's people that are doing that, and whether it be a CBO or a CRS or a, um, you know, a sort of like separate quasi-legislative group. Like in some states, Washington State has the Washington State Institute for Public Policy, where they sort of task this group of saying, we want to do some juvenile justice stuff. We want to know the good stuff and the bad stuff and do more of the good stuff. And they sort of rank this consumer reports kind of list of like, you know, scared straight is really terrible. It costs you a bunch and kids go to jail more often kind of thing. Don't do that. Um, and they have things at the higher level. So Best they can, value. right. And so they can sort of look to that and they don't have to necessarily follow that, but they can kind of quick gut check and look and say, okay, here's the list of things, more of these like things here. Um, and they're not having to go through those individually, I think is key. It, to me, it kind of comes back to the issue of capacity. And some have said, you know, Congress doesn't have the capacity anymore. I, I disagree with that. I think Congress has the capacity if, if it wants to. When it wants to, it can do it. And how would you how would you fit institutionalizing this evidence agenda into the current capacity? There's, you know, I, I meet with people all day um, with, you know, various um, issues they're focused on or things in the state that they're wanting to do. And unfortunately, it's rare that you find the person who can bridge the sort of outside work of what's happening local or the research that's been done and the needs at the legislative level. Um, and a lot of times it's former staff or other folks who can kind of bridge that. You know, we get a lot, I'll have people come in, I've been handed books before, you know? Like, <laughs> here's this book on this, you know, and it all makes sense if you read this book. And it's just like, you know, it's just, it's not possible. Um, you know, DVDs, or I, I have, if anyone wants to come to my office sometime, I have a board game by uh, uh, orthopedic surgeons that you can play that, uh, you know, lays out the various consequences of the great things they can do. Um, so people get creative in trying to get information to Congress, right? Um, and so I think trying to find those translators or, uh, you know, briefings like this or other things where you can take take the sort of abstract and make it concrete. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and some of that, honestly, is by pointing to existing legislation and saying, here's generally a good idea that we think is useful. Here's an example that you can look at and see. And you can talk to these people real world and understand how it worked. And so it does get easier the more there are these types of things happening in statute because there's more things to point to and read about. So I think having that sort of person in the middle is is really tough. And and sometimes, you know, there's think tanks in DC that do good jobs at that. Sometimes it's just lobbyists or other folks, but that's such a key link um, because there's, I'm sure any staff that are here can tell you, they'll have people come in from their state university or others and say, well, here's this 30 page report I wrote on this thing and more research is needed and we're looking at this sort of thing, right? And, uh, and they're just trying to figure out what do I do now? Um, how do I take this and do something with it? So I think um, maybe tackling that problem from the other side is, is like recommendation 13, creating that science and evidence um, ombudsman position of, you know, saying to the scientific community, please stop sending them books. Um, <laughs> you know, send them material that's useful. Uh, and, you know, that board game does sound interesting, I'm not going to lie. Um, but, you know, how, how do we as researchers make our our material digestible, um, you know, and how do we have an idea of what is needed in that moment? Um, the the pace of Congress is is kind of frantic, and you know that is one of the things that I've learned coming in is the timing of things is really important, and you know the timing of decision making does not align well with the timing of research. Research generation tends to be you know it is slow and deliberative in an, an entirely different way, um, you know. So having that liaison position saying you know, this is the best way to present materials. This is the best way to make impactful statements. And this is the kind of evidence that, you know, these are, this is what's going on in the policy world right now. So if we had some evidence about this particular thing, that would be great. If you have it, you know, please, please bring that to us. Um, you know, so that position to, to connect researchers with, with Congress might ease some of the difficulty that Congress has getting information that's useful. One, that just reminded me of one thing too. I think a lot of times what, staff and members of Congress are looking for is directional. It's, we've got this way and this way. Mm -hmm. It's not, 
well, here's this other system, and if we started from scratch, you know, we would do this, or, or if we did this perfect thing, here's how it would go. It, you know, Congress, even though it, sometimes it seems like things are, you know, major changes are being made, it's really incremental. And so a lot of times it's taking that research and saying, you know, it's not that it had this exact impact on this, it's saying generally these types of things seems to be better. You know, this, we've looked at this in child welfare. Programs that have this sort of mentoring component, that have peer support, other things, seem like they're producing better results. And so you can then say, okay, well, let's go more in that direction. Um, so it is a little bit more shoot from the hip sometimes, I think, and researchers, I, I think, may not understand how that might be used and need to be comfortable knowing that they'll come back a year or two later and have that same discussion again about what the next steps might be. Um, I have a couple more questions for the panel, but uh, I'd like to give the audience an opportunity to weigh in at this point. And with that, um, do we have any audience questions? And the, we have a couple of mics. I'm glad to see a lot of hands in the audience. So why don't we start over here with you, sir? If you could Hi, I'm Zach Valdez. I'm also a AAAS fellow with Elena in a Senate committee. Um, and so I know that you mentioned capacity. And, and I think one of the things that I get frustrated as a, as a PhD as well is the uh, the difference between messaging and science. What are they trying to accomplish? Um, and a lot of times when they're doing messaging, they're not trying to accomplish whatever the science is trying to accomplish. They're trying to get to their agenda. And a lot of that comes back to what is evidence. And evidence is just data to support your assertion. That doesn't have to be correct data. That doesn't, that climate change, 98% of scientists believe that it's real. 2% of those scientists can change 40% of how people think. So when we have a consensus, there's something called data transparency. Where are you getting your data from? How many people uh, agree with your data? And I think those are things that we need to push harder than um, capacity is saying, this is what the general, this is science. This is how things are considered. And so I guess my question is, how do you, Elena, you can maybe answer this too, is how do you move past that frustration of saying, science has already told us these things? Um, but your messaging does not align with that. And so a lot of times it's not, it's not the lack of evidence, it's the lack of, of what they're trying to get, accomplish. That is not a question for us. Well, I can jump in. I mean, the answer. I think, <laughs> you're, you're barred from speaking on that. <laughs> no personal opinions. Um, I mean, going back to what Sandy and Tim mentioned earlier was this idea of evidence having a seat at the table, right? I think you're right. I mean, there's gonna be instances where it's not just a, a, you know, a battle of evidence to convince the other person that their position is wrong, right? But I think there are a lot of situations where the evidence can drive the discussion that way. So it may not be 100%, but it may be 80%, right? I mean, a lot of the issues that I deal with in social services, things like that, they're bipartisan, they're bicameral, they always have been. And so evidence, I think, has a lot of potential there. There's clearly landmark, you know, I mean, if we have various studies on gun control and, you know, are we finally just going to convince one or the other that this is the way to go? Possibly. I mean, it may be incremental. Um, it may be sort of snowflakes stacking up and, you know, building a, a strong base where people see um, broadly um, what the, the research is showing. But I think in a lot of cases, it's really just making sure that evidence is at the table at all. Uh, in so many of these situations, it really can just be anecdotal um, or, um, you know, hearings are called because some event happened and there's sort of a reactionary response. Uh, so I, I think just getting it to be brought more frequently into the conversation can lead to those sort of slight directional shifts that'll get us in the right place. I actually realize I do have something to add, <laughs> um, which is what I was talking about before about the CRS and the idea of training. I do think that it's true that in some cases people are just wed to their assertions and it doesn't matter um, what the rest of the world thinks. But I do think there are people that have heard those assertions and don't realize they're mere assertions. And that's where the idea of having a educated consumers at least having an awareness of what are the kinds of questions you would ask when it seems like there's very contradictory evidence out there. Well, what are some things you could ask? What's the consensus and stuff like that? So I think that would be helpful. Um, us old jaded folks, um, you know, <laughs> ought to know better by now. But uh, but for new staff coming in who who quickly play fairly instrumental roles in translating what's going on to their bosses, um, I think it could be helpful. I think within that recommendation, the language around like the appropriateness of certain methodological choices um, kind of speaks to that of 
you know, what is evidence? What are we actually considering good evidence? And, you know, those consensus statements that are made by the community, like they don't just arise out of, you know, thin air. And, you know, to kind of hit home the point of this is, this is real, this is evidence-based, you know, this is what the science says. So that needs to be weighed more heavily than, you know, perhaps anecdotal. And I think, you know, it, you need that, um, that paradigm shift, mm -hmm. you know, that cultural change of how are we going to weigh these things. I think that is a frustration that the scientific community feels often, um, is just feeling like we're saying the same thing over and over and over again and it's not being well received. And I think it will take that cultural shift to, to accomplish that. All right, I'll go. You've already had a one shot. I'll, I'll get back to you, though. We'll go over on this side and we'll go back to that side. Thanks. Um, Caitlin Gazing with the Nurse Family Partnership. And I actually had a question about kind of this presentation of data to congressional staff and this balance of the anecdotal evidence and the actual evidence we're typically faced with when trying to. Um, talk to staff members about our program, we have a whole host of evidence and sometimes they want to hear those anecdotes. We have no problem convincing Ryan, of course, um, but some of the newer staffers, and I don't know if you have any um, just advice to some of the messaging and advocacy folks in the room on how to better message this kind of a balance between handing them a book of evidence and handing them a story about you know one family. That's definitely something that as a fellow, that's part of our learning is, you know, how do we, how do we package our work better? Um, so I am still personally learning that as well. I think that, you know, having that ombuds position is a really great place to, you know, put that information of how do we package better. Um, you know, I think the things that I've learned, you know, like you were saying, graphs, you know, more, um, you know, very detailed, not very detailed, very concrete material. Um, that is short, that gets your point across quickly, which is something academics are not great at. Um, and, you know, having a better idea of what information, what is the most important thing to get across there? And the person that you're talking to, like, what can they move? Because I think a lot of times you give this glut of information of, okay, I'm going to, you know, tell all of this information to this one person, and 85% of that may not at all be relevant for anything they can do anything about. So, you know, really going into those meetings and knowing, okay, this particular person handles this particular thing and this is what they can make change on has been, you know, one thing that I've learned from this process so far, but I think there's plenty more to learn, you know, and you guys are probably better at answering that. No, I think those are all really great points. I think from my perspective, partly why the anecdote is useful is just, just to visualize what you're discussing, right? Because when you come with just the evidence, it's useful to sort of understand we did these tests and here's what we understood. But for people in my position that are meeting with people and sort of hearing about these things, you need to sort of understand, okay, what are you doing? Like, okay, I walk in the door, now what? You know, sort of like walk me through who I meet and what I, you know, so I can like virtual reality, I can put on a headset and like I can go around the office and I can like visit with the people and understand. And so, I don't know if it's so much, hopefully it's not so much for the actual like policy making as it is just the context, just understanding what exactly you're talking about. Because, you know, you can read a whole report about some program and still not really have a feel for who this person was that got services and what happened to them and what was the timeline and who they all worked with. Um, so I think you can sort of use that to frame what is the, your, what your services are and what you're doing. And then I think you can use the data to sort of step back more broadly and say, and when you do that 100,000 times across the country, we see this kind of thing as a result. Not to toot our own horn here at BPC, but I would urge you to look at page five of the report. This summary of options for improving the use of evidence. I notice, not that I'm looking at your notes, but I am looking at your notes. Everyone has this opened up here. And this is a really good way of presenting, I think, I think of presenting your case forward. It's on one page, it allows it allows staff and members, anyone, the opportunity to look at it quickly to digest it. So when you're advocating and you're putting forward your positions, be able to put it in, in concise, easily understandable and digestible information that then you can dig deeper into. So that, that would always be my suggestion. Um, you're, in, back, in back of you, and I'll, I'll come back to you, ma'am. Good afternoon. My name is Rebecca Sheffield. I work for the American Foundation for the Blind doing policy and research and I have a background and a PhD in special education. So um, 
since since coming to AFB, I love hearing about evidence-based policymaking, and I'm also terrified because I almost never hear anybody explain evidence of what when they're talking about this. I have evidence or I have results, and um, I worry that it puts all evidence on the same playing field. I've seen this with the what some of the what works clearinghouse, and and especially when it comes down to to putting the evidence into practice, making a decision about what's going to be done in a school district that, well, this is evidence-based and there hasn't been research conducted on that, so this is the thing we're going to use. And no one ever asks evidence of what. Well, the evidence is that it reduces the number of kids in special education. Well, is that really a good thing for all, all the kids who might need special education? Anyway, it's, it's complicated and it needs more explanation and you only have a few minutes to, or a, a few paragraphs to explain what's going on. So um, I'm glad we're having this discussion. I, I hope that we don't, um, we don't, you know, oversimplify what we're talking about. And I like the, I really like the idea of um, making sure that we have capacity and expertise on staff in these offices to, to as um, Ryan was saying, like understand the context around what's going on. But my, many questions, I'll, I'll pick one. How can the low incidence populations for whom it is most difficult to conduct research and collect evidence, how can we make sure that we're not getting lost and that we, that um, we're not seeing policy made that is necessary simply because it's very difficult to have evidence or the evidence, which oftentimes by evidence it means cost effectiveness, right? That's the, that's the, it's a euphemism for cost effectiveness. When, when we're a population that's expensive to serve, how do we make sure that this move to evidence-based policy making reflects, for example, evidence of improved quality of life, evidence of things that we really value and that we don't get lost when the common denominator is usually a, a dollar value, and we're hard to we're hard to research. I will say that one possible place is that database, and being very clear about the outcomes that we're talking about within that database. Um, you know, and being clear about how we structure that to say, you know, when we are saying this program works, what is it doing? Um, you know, are we talking about the people? Are we talking about the money? Are we talking about you know the the context of of the program operations? What do we mean when we're saying that it works? So I think that setting up that database very clearly is going to be important for the things that you said. I also think um, in legislation, along with setting up the evidence stuff, uh, Congress could afford, I mean, there are like findings, and I forget what the other like front matter um, things are, but you could say what your expectations were of what this program was going to accomplish in a fairly concrete way. And, and to me, that would be then helpful when evidence is produced. Well, evidence of what? Is it evidence that shows whether or not this, this thing um, uh, met Congress's uh, intent or expectations? Yeah. And I think you bring up a really good point, which is a, a huge part of this is making sure that the sort of strive to build evidence doesn't outpace the focus on what the outcome should be, right? And, and so there are a lot of programs where the outcomes are a little more process-based right now, you know, number of classes taught or brochures handed out or people visited or things like that. And I think that's where Congress needs to spend a lot of time too, is really trying to say, when we say we want to, you know, provide food assistance, what are we trying to do? Are we, you know, is this a measure of hunger that we're trying to satisfy, or is there a poverty line we're trying to get people above, or is there an employment rate we're trying to hit, or what is that metric? Because you're right, I mean, if we focus on the wrong metric, uh, you can have evidence showing something that's cost effective, right? But, or it's reducing use of some service, but maybe that service is really useful <laughs> and people need it. Uh, so that, that, I think, deserves the same type of attention as this as well. Yes, ma'am. Hi, thanks for the second question. Stacy Bridges, Veterans Vision. Um, question and a comment. First of all, um, I was always taught at American University to, to stick to the KISS method, keep it simple, stupid. And um, this little flyer that the Bipartisan Center came out pretty much summed up the whole report that brought me to my next question. <laughs> um, you said the least feasible things that could um, happen to make options for improving the use of evidence-based uh, was number five, 12, and 17 of page number five. Um, increased resources for existing legislative um, support. 
um, provide congressional research services with resources to conduct systematic evidence reviews and conduct portfolios review and to support broadband. This is the least feasible, okay, these three. Uh, is there any way we can make these highly, you know, most likely to happen? If it's least feasible, will this actually be more helpful to, to, to implement these things or it's just sort of like a waste of time, do you think? Did that How make do we, sense? I'll defer to the authors of the report. <laughs> I thought I was done. <laughs> okay, so I'll just say, and I'll defer to my colleagues here as well. I, I think on those those feasibility assessments, um, it was sort of a broad sense of of how kind of, in part, how possible we thought these these were, um, if they involved a you know a substantial commitment of resources, for example, or there were big institutional changes that would have to be made. Saying that it wasn't feasible didn't mean that it wasn't a good idea. That's not a measure of the effectiveness of it uh, so much or the, the value of it. It's just in sort of a in, a, in, a, in an attempt to sort of give a sense of what's the, as Dan said, the low-hanging fruit versus the things that might take a little more effort or that might be much a little more, a bit more politically difficult to carry out. Um, it's not whether they're effective or we don't think they're great ideas. We think everything in there is a great idea. Uh, but that's just sort of how to take that feasibility assessment uh, from, from our perspective. Any of my colleagues wish to add to that? No? Uh, so, anyway. But I'm glad you like the table and <laughs> find it useful. <laughs> we have time for about one more question. So you get, you get a second bite at the apple. Hi, I'm Samira Daniels. I just wanted to push back on... Uh, uh, some of what you're saying, and uh, is this, I, I've been following the uh, uh, Professor Tetlock's uh, super forecaster and expert political judgment and the IARPA programs in the government, which are to improve intelligence. And, you know, there's some lessons learned from that about what is evidence. And uh, it boils down to, you know, how do we think about things? And I, I cannot see, you know, so, such a fantastic idea as your, uh, you know, the program and uh, effort that you're suggesting, some incorporation of this critical, th some kind of training of critical thinking to staff people. And this is, to me, in all the years that I've come up here in different, uh, you know, situations, uh, th th the staff sits back and you know, sort of absorbs thing. And I think that, that it's, it's this critical, the, the quality of the evidence is also the issue, as you're suggesting. But that can't, you know, the staff is not in a position really, as you, you yourself are suggesting, to make those assessments. They need training of some sort. And um, th this, would be po th this would be a force multiplier if you can somehow incorporate that. This is not a matter even of low-hanging fruit because that's going to take, you know, you, you even said yourself, it's in, incremental. And it is incremental here. So I'm wondering, you know, if you could, you know, in, in your follow-up or, or even during this, incorporate some of this, uh, the lessons that are learned from some of these larger projects that the government has uh, uh, initiated for now seven years. And it's, it's, I think it's going to be critical to your success of, of th this venture? I think um, your comment reminds me of, an, uh, I was at a government evaluators meeting. This is like a, uh, I think <laughs> G some folks from GAO, I think it was actually at GAO, it was like um, evaluation shops across the government. And we were talking about some legislation we were working on, we were talking specifically about a What Works Clearinghouse and sort of the idea of evidence and, and focusing on results. and. Someone, you know, had kind of been, this was like hundreds of people, and I didn't realize, they were, I mean, this was all across the government, this was lots of people, and uh, sitting in a panel, sort of going through this, and there's this person you can see who's just kind of getting a little more frustrated. They finally raise their hand and say, well, how much training did congressional staff and like quantitative methods and analysis and all this stuff, how much do they get when they start, you know? And it was just like, wow, okay, like, <laughs> no, <laughs> they, they don't. Some do, some have this background, and I mean, we have some people who are, you know, PhD researchers that come to work on the Hill or former, you know, doctors and all sorts of things. I mean, we have a fellow in Senator Hatch's office right now who's an ER physician. So, I mean, we've got some people who are really specific and focus on a certain area, but I think you highlight a good point, which is, 
trying to find that balance between, you know, in, in some cases that I work in, there may be a specific policy that I'm working on for a number of years where me and the other staff sort of on the Republican and Democrat side really can get together and spend multiple meetings going through evidence with folks. Um, so there are those sort of landmark big changes where that does happen. I think the, the tougher issue is when you think about all the staff coming into a personal office and meeting with the legislative assistant and providing this information. Um, I think some of it is, this is partly why you see these coalition efforts. You see the association of something, right? And they're sort of like presenting their position because they've consolidated their views into one sort of product for that, that discipline. Um, and so I think that can be effective. Uh, but it is that balance, because I really don't feel, and I think you read really this too, that we just want staff of members to be given all the reports and sort of you know, weigh them on the scales and determine what the policy should be. But I think there's ways to make it easier to translate to those folks. There's ways to bundle that either through support organizations or outside groups, um, and again, to sort of provide that nudge in one direction or another. But it's a continual balance, because some staff really will have the time and the interest in a specific area to dig really deep into a policy and go around the country and meet with everyone and bring in a panel of people to testify in a hearing. So it does happen. Um, but I think we need to think of gradations of that all the way from sort of one page and a summary of what's going on to the sort of like multi-day type meetings and things like that because it's a tough, it's a tough deal issue. The only thing I would add to that is is the sort of saving grace, whether staff are um, trained critical thinkers or not, uh, is if you're hearing from a whole bunch of people, you are likely to hear a whole bunch of different things. And so in trying, and your job is to try to sort that out. I mean, we always at CBO uh, encourage all the staff to treat anything they're told with a healthy degree of skepticism. And I think you can't, it doesn't take very long or very many meetings where you hear two diametrically opposed things about uh, the same issue from someone before you do start having that skepticism. And, and also through the process of being told something one year having legislation to go into effect, seeing what happens, and you start realizing it's not all so simple as it's sometimes presented. So, so I think staff, even, even uh, staff that may have come from a totally different discipline, I mean, almost everybody is, has some degree of critical thinking. But it, I think you can't help as you go through life on the hill um, gaining experience, at least, that, uh, but it doesn't necessarily train you um, uh, on what the best methods are that you should really pay attention to. Elena, you want to did you, you want to follow up or? I think it's been covered. <laughs> well, on that note, we are coming toward the conclusion of our program today. But I wanted to give our panelists the last word. So, are there any key takeaways that uh, you would like to share with the audience today to think about? in terms of the paper, or did we miss anything, overlook anything? Is there anything for a volume three that you think that the bipartisan policy center should be looking at? So I'll start with you, Elena, thank you. Sure, I was just, you know, I was encouraged by the content of the, the report, um, you know, to offer these options. And, you know, to let the, the, to me, this kind of signals maybe to the scientific community, some things that may, you know, be coming up and some ways that uh, we can be looking on the horizon to support this evidence-based effort um, and to be prepared to, you know, continue our efforts. I'm part of the, you know, American Association for the Advancement of Science, you know, so of how we can, you know, continue to insert science. So as a researcher, I'm, you know, heartened by, by this report. Thank you. Holly. Well, uh, I would say, I, I mean, I continue to believe that uh, Focusing on ways to make it easy <laughs> is, is the most likely way to make progress on this front. And by making it easy, I mean um, assisting staff in having a common language and a common perspective to review things, things like databases that show good examples and collect them in one place that's easy to find, and um, um, the idea of um, uh, routinizing, if you will, uh, um, some um, goals and evidence collection uh, in the process of authorization. Um, 
I, I do think there's one thing we haven't talked about very much, or, or uh, which is that there needs to be, uh, I think, more energetic follow-up mm -hmm. on uh, the prescription sometimes put into legislation. I, I remember I, almost any piece of legislation that comes through requires this, that, and the other report. But then sometimes later, next time I'm trying to do a cost estimate on that topic, I go look for that report. Well, it never seems to have been produced, or it's still in review somewhere. I mean, the lag between when something was due to Congress and when it actually arrives and what the quality of it is when it arrives, and I'm, I'm really not dissing the executive branch because they have a lot of competing priorities, um, there has to be some attention paid, I guess, to the evidence Congress has asked to have produced. And that's again, gets to the making use of evidence more routine, creating space in the legislative cycle for consideration of evidence where there's time to sort of, in a focused way, ask people <laughs> where the heck is the report they were expecting. So um, I, I do think, um, that's very easy to say, uh, and there's a lot of competing demands. <laughs> Ryan? I think that point about follow-up, I want to build on that, because some of the most productive meetings I've had, um, and the ones that staff and members are most receptive to, is when legislation has, has passed a number of years ago, and people come in and say, okay, this was the intention, and then here's what's happened. Um, and here's how we can make sure this intention is better met. And so you're already cross, you don't have to cross that bridge of why do it or how do it because it's already been enacted. It's more about that course correction. Uh, and, and so you already have, you can sort of restart the old coalitions that supported it before. You can get better information on what's going on. There's sort of a built in political will. And you can change the course a little bit and try and find, you know, use the new information to inform the, the version 2.0 or 3.0 of whatever this program is. So I know that's one that's been uh, really effective. And then lastly, I know I've said this a number of times, but I, I really, um, I think this report has been great. And I'm, I'm glad that the focus is, you know, not so much on having the staff and the members be the total arbiter of the evidence, because I feel like both for capacity and other reasons that Congress can be great in helping to set a framework where that can be used in an orderly way. Um, but I don't think we want to have each decision um, reaching a point where staff or members have to weigh all the competing evidence and make that decision, but setting more frameworks for those things to happen. Well, with that, I'd like to conclude the panel discussion here today and thank each of the panelists for your efforts and preparation. Uh, I'm in preparing for this, I said that we have a hard stop at 355, and look congratulations, at, we at made that, that. just that. in time for. Uh, yeah, well, thank. Uh, first, of, thank uh, thank you, the audience, for uh, being here, this, sticking sticking in with us, and thank you, Dan and, and Elena and Holly and Ryan. Thank you for your public service too. I think there was a little bit of discussion here about public service, really getting people involved in participating and coming to working on the hill for. 25 years or whatever. Um, thank you, Sandy, Tim, uh, uh, Nick, uh, Daniel, if you're here. Uh, I want to also uh, give a shout out again to the Arnold Foundation. This has been a, a report. I'm glad you liked the report in the term of the simplification. I'll take that back to the boss. Uh, this has been a labor of uh, love for uh, BPC staff, I can tell you. And I don't think when I wooed, uh, wooed Sandy out of retirement to take on this project that he or I realized how long this was going to take to get it done. So it's been a, it's been a real uh, labor of love, as I say. So thank you all for uh, coming out this afternoon, and thank you, I hope, for helping us to keep up, uh, be ch all be champions of uh, evidence and uh, improving the, uh, the uh, culture of evidence in the Congress going forth. Thank you. Good day. I wish I was a scientist. Oh.